Ani Buju, Tabitha Indigena Kos, Nipissing Indigena Ba, Mijisi Dodem. I know we weren't supposed to introduce ourselves, but introducing myself in Anishinaabe is a way of recognizing the territory that we meet on today. And, and I, I want to say thank you for having me, and it's an honor to be here. Before I begin, I do want to uh, recognize again the traditional territory that we're on today. It's the territory of many nations, including Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people, of which I'm very thankful and proud to be one and be here, so thank you. So when the opportunity came to speak uh, at an event titled The Future of Consumerism, I was initially a little perplexed. The first thought that came to mind was akin to the first de definition of consumerism in the Oxford Dictionary. The preoccupation of society with the acquisition of consumer goods now, I did not have the privilege of growing up in my First Nation, immersed in my culture. However, I was lucky enough to learn a lot from my grandmothers and my aunties and stories of teachings along the way. And all of those teachings are centered around sustainability, about taking only what you need, about thinking about everything with seven generations and what the impact would be on the seventh generation from you. So in my mind, consumerism was a far cry from Indigenous values and beliefs. And as the COO of Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, how was I going to marry those two ideas and bring some perspective to tonight? So consumerism is also a word that was not widely used until the 1960s. And there's another definition in the Oxford Dictionary. It's that it's the social and economic order that drives the acquisition of goods and services in increasing amounts. And from that idea, many believe in consumerism as a concept that consumers should be informed decision makers in the marketplace. And that's where the light bulb went on for me. I will share you any electrical engineering puns that would be awkward and probably not funny for everybody. Uh, I do believe that most of us are striving for a simpler lifestyle, indigenous or not. And that suggests a more sustainable environment and a way of life. However, consuming services and goods and spending money is good for our economy. So the challenge is how do we drive the social economic order to acquire goods with a focus and a consideration of the impact of that purchase or investment, and where can we make a tangible impact today? I don't want this to become a history lesson, nor do I want to make this a difficult conversation about the injustice that has occurred to Indigenous people for hundreds of years. But sometimes those difficult conversations are the best. I trust that you are all here because you're all well-informed people. It is a walrus talk. Some of you likely have read Seven Fallen Fathers by Tanya Talaga or Jesse Thistles from the Ashes. Many of you have likely watched The Indian Horse or The Grizzlies, and almost all of you, I am sure, have seen a recent news story about the over 100 boil water advisories in First Nations across Canada, the high youth suicide rates, or missing and murdered Indigenous women. And maybe, hopefully, you've asked or you're asking what you can do and what your role is in reconciliation and the calls to action. So here's one suggestion. There is power in your wallet. There's power in the purchasing ability that you have at work, in the vendors that you choose, and there's power in your investment. We make choices every day about what coffee we drink, what lip gloss we wear, who we use to cater our office lunch, or design our new logo, or who we buy our pens from. It isn't about spending more money, it's about directing the money you already spend towards a positive impact and the possibility of starting your own path towards reconciliation. CCAB's latest research indicates that there are over 50,000 Indigenous businesses in Canada, businesses which are focused on sustainability, integrity, and are giving back to their communities. So I want to share with you tonight a few examples of CCAB's certified Aboriginal businesses, and one which CCAB and I use myself regularly. Birchbach Birch Bark Coffee is a certified organic fair trade coffee that's grown and produced by Indigenous farmers. The company is founded by a First Nation entrepreneur from Wakumakong First Nation on Manitoulin Island. And he is making the world a better place one bag of coffee at a time. Proceeds from all coffee sales enable them to purchase and install certified water, for water purification systems in Indigenous community homes for free. For every 50 bags of coffee they sell, or you buy, they provide one purification system. We are proud to drink and serve birch bark coffee in our office at CCAB and at home. Design to Plume is an indigenous female-owned graphic design firm by passionate forward-thinking designers. 
with their combination of diverse work experiences from mining to medical, education to retail, they support many community initiatives and promote economic development across Canada. When CFL came on board as a member of CCAB, they wanted to use an Indigenous design firm to create their logo. We connected them with Design de Plume, and the result was this illustration, which brings together aspects of the quill box, the hoops from the hoop dancers, other traditional patterns, and the CFL. Design de Plume gives back regularly by supporting Indigenous youth through employment and scholarships. And what's more, it adds diversity in that it's an Indigenous women-owned business. Similarly, Jen Harper launched Cheekbone Beauty three years ago. After a lifetime in the food industry, she woke up after a dream one morning, followed that dream, and began building her cosmetic enterprise. Cheekbone Beauty is an Indigenous-owned digital direct-to-consumer beauty brand. The company is culturally appropriate, customer-focused, highly authentic, relatable, and they help Indigenous youth see themselves in a national beauty brand. Plus, 10% of their profits are donated to Shannon's Dream in support of educational equity for Indigenous youth. These aren't small or immature businesses. I'm sure you've all heard of Dragon's Den, where aspiring entrepreneurs pitch their business concepts and products to a panel of Canadian business moguls. It takes more than passion to convince these boardroom barons that an idea is a good investment. The dragons are ruthless, and rightly so. It's their money. Cheekbone Beauty has proven that they have what it takes, and they will be on the premiere of Dragon's Den on September 26th, so we're wishing them all the best. Marissa Magnuson is an Indigenous photographer based in Toronto. She specializes in event photography and includes Indigenous perspectives in all her work. She works closely with many organizations, such as York University, where this powwow photo was taken, Hydra One, Music Fest Canada, and CCAB. Creating art for her clients, she connects it to land and culture, providing new perspectives. Her art tells a story and invites questions for discussion. And niche branding is the creation of two Indigenous ex-NHL hockey players, Sean Rivers and John Chabot. After retiring from hockey, they both were connected in Ottawa, having both played for the Senators at one point in their career, and decided to compile their resources to establish an Indigenous brand agency. They were faced with many hurdles to be recognized as a legitimate player in that space. They spent a lot of time establishing credibility and exposure for their brand, and they now run a successful communications company that specializes in providing promotional items, printing, graphic design, and pens for our office. The age of consumerism and that of today's modern consumer stands to benefit by procuring from and investing in these and many other Aboriginal businesses. When consumers recognize the importance of thriving Aboriginal businesses and enterprises, it creates sustainable economic opportunities for Indigenous peoples. And when Indigenous people do well economically, Canada does well. The Indigenous economy is already growing at an exponential rate, as is the Indigenous community. Indigenous peoples contribute over $31 billion annually to Canada's GDP, and based on this growth, the CCAB estimates that it's expected to increase to $100 billion by 2024. With Indigenous people being the youngest and fastest growing demographic in Canada, we're creating businesses at nine times the rate of the average non-Indigenous Canadian, and with over 50,000 Indigenous businesses in Canada operating in every sector, size, and region, this also means the purchasing power of Indigenous people increases exorbitantly as employment and entrepreneurship continue to rise. The fundings substantiate that the future of Canada's economy is Indigenous. Companies, consumers, you and I, supporting strong Aboriginal businesses is an important pathway to healing Canada's relationship with First Nation, Inuit and Métis people. Economic reconciliation is where we can make the biggest impact every day. Chi miigwech.